the name you have, the nickname Mums, has yes. significance. Mums, maybe Jackie. Well, uh, the show people named me that. They did, yeah. Yes, both uh, both races, they named me Mum because I don't know why, uh, even though I was young, they would always bring their problems to me to settle. And then they buy so many, sometimes they get away from home and wouldn't be able to get back and I'd send them home. Well, I'd always put on a pot or something like that. And when I know that those ones that didn't have very much money, I see that they were fed. Thing like that. So they named me, Mom. I didn't give myself that name. I know. Welcome back to Queer Sip. Today, we're diving into the life of a 20th century legend. Comedian Jackie Moms Maybelline, the first queen of comedy and one of the first stand-up comedians in America. Most people have never heard of Jackie Moms Maybelline, who was a trailblazing comedian who left a lasting impact on big-time comedians like Red Fox, Chris Rock, Bill Cosby, Richard Pryor, and many other comedians. She paved the way and opened the doors for female comedians like Monique, Joan Rivers, Simone, Lunell, Wanda Sykes, and many others. Langston Hughes himself crowned her the funniest woman alive during her time. Dick Gregory said at her funeral in 1975 that if she was a white woman, she would have been known 50 years earlier. Moms Maybelline dedicated herself to live entertainment, first through singing and dancing. She became a cherished vaudeville star among Black Americans in the vaudeville era. She cultivated a devoted Black audience for decades before eventually recording a comedy act. Despite winning the hearts of Black people early on, starting in the early 1920s, it took until the 1960s for her to capture the attention of a white audience. Despite her significant contributions to the comedy world, the comedy recordings of Moms Maybelline's first 40 years in the entertainment industry are rare. As a Black female comedian during a time of segregation, Jim Crow, and racism in America, she did not receive the recognition she deserved until decades later. Having spent decades in the Black vaudeville scene and not being known by the mainstream media, she worked her way up to becoming the first woman ever to grace the legendary Apollo Theater stage in April of 1939. Moms Maybelline was in the same league as legends like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and Zora Neale Hurston. Fast forward to 1962, she achieved another milestone as the first female comedian to headline at Carnegie Hall, gradually expanding her audience to include white viewers. Moms Maybelline was known for her comedian act of a dirty old lady with a penchant for younger men. She played this comedy act for over 50 years. Her signature line became, there ain't nothing an old man can do for me, but bring me a message from a young one. Moms Maybelline was known for her unique and often risque comedic style. Her comedy acts in the 60s as a old raunchy woman included discussing topics and addressing issues that were rarely discussed in mainstream entertainment during her era. But Moms Maybelline didn't have it easy being the old raunchy lady tackling subjects like sex and politics. Civil rights groups advocated for comedians to abandon vaudeville acts as a means of promoting a dignified representation of Blackness. The NAACP was all about promoting normal images of Black men and women in various media outlets like print, advertising, radio, and TV. Despite the pressure, Maybelline refused to be hindered by these concerns. She cleverly embraced the traditional vaudeville vibes wearing vibrant colors and mismatched outfits while still incorporating singing 
and dance routines, setting her apart from others. Her cleverness extended to addressing topics that few could navigate, such as politics, racism, and segregation. A February 22, 1962 edition of Jet Magazine was titled, Are Negro Comics Too Serious? There were four faces on the cover, Dick Gregory, Slappy White, Nipsey Russell, and Jackie Moms Mabley. The article drew attention to the shift in Black comedy. It seemed as if the vaudeville days were closing out in favor of sets that discussed integration problems, politics, racism, and world affairs. The 1960s was a pivotal decade for the civil rights movement in the United States, marked by significant social, political, and legislative changes aimed at addressing racial discrimination and segregation. Moms Mabley used the stage and her comedic performances to criticize racism and segregation in the United States. She used sarcasm when discussing integrated schools. In her comedic performances, she skillfully utilized stories to portray and present various situations that were going on in America at the time. On her 1963 Young Men See, Old Men Know vinyl album, she discussed a young African-American boy who integrated into a white school and was subjected to racism when he was singled out from his white classmates and given an unreasonably difficult word to make him appear unintelligent. While he was allowed to attend the integrated school, he was not treated equally. 1963 album, Young Men See, Old Men Know, she again used sarcasm and humor in a similar fashion to illustrate the violent history African Americans have been subjected to in the United States. In her performance, she goes, two men, one white fellow, one colored fellow held up a bank, killed three bank tellers, two policemen, wounded bystander woman, sentenced them to be hung. They are gonna be hung. White fella sitting in his cell crying. I don't want to be hung. I don't want to be hung. Colored fella said, oh man, we killed all them people. You talking about you don't want to be hung. They going to hang us. So why don't you face it like a man? White fella say, that's easy for you to say because you used to it. The tradition of lynching African-Americans in the United States which was especially prevalent in the late 19th and early 20th century, but continued during the era of Maybelline's performances in the 1960s. She also performed this joke on the often controversial Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour in 1967, a show that encouraged the raw, politically savvy elements of comedy. By performing this joke on television, as well as on her earlier record, Mabelie exposed a large audience to the violence African-Americans have been historically subjected to as a result of white racism. On her album, I Got Something to Tell You, also from 1963, addressed James Meredith's enrollment at the University of Mississippi in a song. James Meredith attempted to enroll at the University of Mississippi and was denied twice in 1961 due to segregation. The NAACP brought the case to the Supreme Court, which ruled in their favor. After successfully enrolling in 1962, despite Governor Ross Barnett's attempt to block his enrollment and facing opposition from the white students who rioted against integration, the situation led Attorney General Robert Kennedy to deploy U.S. Marshals to maintain control. She sang about her conversation with James Meredith to the beat of the Dixie song, which is a traditional African-American spiritual and over the rainbow. There was trouble happening in another part of the world. They called Mississippi. 
A young man was beating his heart out because he couldn't understand. I said, what's the matter, son? He said, Mom, I don't want to give up love and be dissatisfied. But just to save my hide, I think I'd be better off outside. I should have quit school the night they shot it, sis. Mom, you don't know what kind of places if I can't study long no more. Falls way down here in the band of cotton, still more righteous, still forgotten. Stay away, stay away, stay away from the clan. Now, Mom, you may think that I'm just joking, but I'd like to get the first thing smoking and get away. If I wish I could leave Dixie, I'd say, hooray, though I was born, I don't see why I have to die in Dixie. Call me, I want a degree, but it's tough to get in Dixie. I said, son, tell them, tell all of them, then mom said, that there's no difference under the skin. I don't know why they won't let you stay in. He said, Mama, all that is true. But every time I do, they make me stop before I begin. Then is somewhere over where there's no gym from. You must fly because of the Supreme Court. Can't fix it so you can stay there. How in the In reality, James Meredith remained at the University of Mississippi and finished his degree, despite consistent hostility from many of the white students at the school. By using James Meredith, Mabley highlighted the danger facing African Americans who challenged white racism in the South. Furthermore, she often criticized Alabama's Governor George Wallace in her comedic performances utilizing him as a symbol to represent institutionalized racism in the United States. Segregation tomorrow and segregation forever. On Mom's Mabley at the Geneva Conference 1962, she presented a fictional nightmare he had about Black people running the White House. Mabley tirelessly helped fight for rights for Black people in the United States. On August 11th of 1962, she performed at an Apollo Theater show sponsored by the U.S. National Student Association. The purpose of the benefit was to raise money for the Southern Students Freedom Fund, which provided the means for those students in the South who had been expelled from school or jailed for their participation in civil rights activities. She utilized her own performances to generate funds for civil rights initiatives. And on her 1965 album, Now Hear This, she told her audience that she was selling photographs in the lobby of the venue to raise money for Martin Luther King Jr.'s March in Selma, Alabama. Moms Mabley's commentary on race and civil rights exhibited shifts in the 1960s that reflected the changes taking place in the modern civil rights movement. However, after she released Moms Mabley at the White House Conference in 1966, 
this discussion of race and politics slowly disappeared from her comedy records. Her commentary on race relations completely disappeared from her comedy acts in the 1970s. She no longer discussed civil rights, racism, segregation, or Jim Crow in her comedy routines or recordings. Before transitioning into mainstream media and recording comedy vinyl albums in the 60s as Mobs Mabley, Jackie Mabley began her career as a singer and dancer as part of the Toba Circuit, also known as the Theater Owners Booking Association. Well, I tell you, son, I uh, was in Buffalo, New York, and uh, as young girls do that run away from home sometimes, get in a little thing that they shouldn't. But I, I, was all, I was raised with God-fearing parents, and I always prayed a lot. And I got on my knees at Ms. Lanier's house in Buffalo and prayed to God to open a way. And I don't know whether you've ever heard a voice like that or not, but something said to me, go on stage. And I know none of my people for generations back had never been on the stage. You know, how old were you then? You were about 13, 14? Uh, I was around 15 years old. 15 years old. 15 years old. So it was in Buffalo, then you became... Uh, yes, I... Part... What sort of shows? Camp? Shows? No, no, no. I've never been on a circus or anything like that, or a burlesque or anything. And there was a circuit called the T.O.B.A., which was the greatest thing and should be today because it taught young people how to be entertainers, both as uh, in character as well as ability. Initially, she used her birth name, Loretta Aiken, at the start of her career. However, she eventually decided to adopt the name Jackie Mabley, prompted by concerns from her brother who feared that a female presence in theater could tarnish the Aiken family name. Loretta adopted the stage name Jackie Mabley, borrowing the name of an early boyfriend, Jack Mabley, who was also a performer. Loretta started on the vaudeville circuit, specifically designed to nurture and showcase Black talent for Black audiences. Operating in a segregated environment where Black individuals were often restricted to balconies and white theaters or banned from entry altogether, Black-owned theaters and theater associations emerged. Collaborating with the Theater Owners Booking Association, these Black-led entities created opportunities that far surpassed the limited options available in white-owned theaters and associations. Black vaudeville performances were advertised in Black newspapers, and the reviews on Toba performances helped many Black performers gain notoriety. Singers like Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith experienced a boost in record sales thanks to the raving reviews of their Toba performances. Despite the humorous acronym suggesting Toba meant tough on black asses, Jackie Moms Mabley emphasized that it was a valuable learning ground for entertainers. The circuit taught performers the importance of versatility requiring everyone to be familiar with each other's role in case someone fell ill and couldn't take the stage. Maybe Lee worked her way up the Toba circuit and eventually moved to Harlem, New York, approximately around 1921. When she moved to New York, she turned to writing comedy at the encouragement of a husband and wife comedy act named Butterbeans and Susie. For my role. Little did Butter Beans and Susie know at the time that their encouragement would inspire Mabley to become not only a pioneering comedian in the entertainment industry, but also one of the most influential stand up comedians of all time. Butter Beans and Susie played a crucial role in guiding Mom's Mabley transition from the Toba circuit to a more lucrative career as a comedian. 
Introducing her to Harlem, moms wasted no time gracing the stage of renowned venues like the Savoy, Connie's Inn, and the Cotton Club. Loretta earned the affectionate nickname Jackie Moms Maybelline due to her nurturing demeanor towards her colleagues on the Black Bobville circuit. Embracing this maternal persona, she transformed her earnings from $14 a week with Toba to an impressive $90 a week in Harlem, portraying an old cheeky woman with a penchant for younger men. At the height of her career in the 30s and 40s, she was earning $10,000 a week performing at the Apollo Theater. She was a crowd pleaser at both the Cotton Club in Harlem and Club Harlem in Atlantic City, sharing the stage with icons like Count Basie, Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, before adopting her iconic persona as Moms Mabelie, she was known only by the name Jackie Mabelie. She performed at Connie's Inn in 1923, and at this time, she delivered her comedy acts in an androgynous style, sporting male attire, including a suit with a tie, handkerchief, and men's dress shoes. Her short hair was slicked back, creating a distinctive look that resonated with the audience. Jackie's androgynous presentation gained popularity and the demand for more grew. She became a trailblazer, opening doors for others like Gladys Bentley to also showcase their talents and androgynous clothing on stage. In the documentary, Whoopi Goldberg presents Moms Mabley. Norma Miller, the queen of swing dancing, disclosed that she shared a room with Mabelie and Mabelie's girlfriend for a two-week period at the Apollo Theater. She also disclosed that Moms was authentic. On stage, she was Moms, but the moment she stepped off that stage, she was Mr. Moms, no doubt about it. Norma Miller also mentioned that they never labeled moms as homosexual because that term didn't suit her. They never called her gay. Instead, they referred to her as Mr. Moms. According to Billy Mitchell, a historian for the Apollo Theater, the first instance he witnessed a woman in men's clothing was Jackie Mabley. Even though Jackie Mabley was seen with women, her romantic relationships is something she didn't talk about. She was rarely associated with having a boyfriend and was frequently seen with beautiful women. She did, however, become a mother. Jackie Mabelie's androgynous performances went through a significant transformation, marking the beginning of her journey as Jackie Moms Mabley at the Apollo Theater, this transformation resonated within the Black community. Many could identify the character she portrayed as a raunchy older Black lady from their own families, be it a grandmother or a crazy aunt. The androgynous clothing and comedy routines were replaced as she fully embraced the persona of Jackie Moms Mabley the cherished old raunchy lady. Her comedy act depicted her as an elderly woman, despite being a young lady herself, adorned in old senior citizens' clothes, colorful outfits, gray wigs, and a floppy hat. While she maintained her onstage signature colorful old lady costume and floppy hat, Mabelie often continued to wear androgynous clothing, such as silk shirts, pants, and a stylish fedora hat in her personal life. Former you are, the artist, your whole background. Well, I tell you, son, I uh, was in Buffalo, New York. And uh, as young girls do that run away from home sometimes, get in a little thing that they shouldn't. But I, I was all, I was raised with God-fearing parents. 
We were you from North Carolina? Yes, Bavard, North Carolina. It ain't, it ain't on the map. You go to Asheville, then you uh, you know take a buggy and go to Bavard, I suppose. Tell us about the, Bavard. One of the greatest places on earth. Sadly, during Mom's Maybelline's childhood, there are allegations of traumatic events that occurred. Rumors surrounding her life filled with pain and trauma having circulated for decades. Her personal life remains largely mysterious as she seldom discussed her childhood in interviews. Mom's Maybelline's real name was Loretta Mary Aiken, and she was born in Brevard, North Carolina sometime between 1897 and 1899. Her parents were James Aiken and Mary Smith. According to Maybelline, she claimed a heritage of mixed Black, Cherokee, Indian, and Irish ancestry. She came from a prosperous and highly successful Black family. She described her home as mansion-like and stood out as one of the finest houses in Brevard, North Carolina. Her father, James Aiken, a well-respected Black man in the early 1900s, was a versatile entrepreneur, businessman, and Freemason who owned multiple establishments in Brevard, North Carolina during a time of Jim Crow. His ventures included a general store, a barber shop, bakery, rental houses, and even a cafe. James Aiken's entrepreneurial journey began with selling apple cider and gingerbread made by his mother. Later, he opened the first barber shop on Main Street in Brevard, North Carolina, catering to a white clientele. He was admired by both the white and black communities. He was also among the original members of a discreet black society in 1890 known as the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. Meetings for this group took place upstairs over his store. Furthermore, he played a crucial role in the establishment of Brevard's North Carolina's first black school. Maybelline's mother was a homemaker that supplemented the family income by renting out rooms to lodgers in their home. Despite having such a renowned and respected father, Mom's Maybelline allegedly experienced traumatic incidents in her childhood. There has been a persistent rumor suggesting that Mom's Maybelline might have endured sexual assault by the age of 14, a claim that has circulated over the years. According to the rumors, she allegedly experienced assault at the age of 11, reportedly by an elderly Black man, and two years later by a white sheriff. It is said that she became pregnant in both instances and gave the two children up for adoption. However, it's important to note that there was no evidence supporting these rumors. The closest Maybelline came to discussing her childhood and children was in an interview where she shared a story from her past. At the age of 14, she recounted her role as a wet nurse for a family in Asheville, North Carolina. She breastfed and cared for an infant whose mother couldn't produce milk. Maybelline provided formula for the baby. She mentioned having her own baby during this time named Lucretia. In the interview, she talked about telling Lucretia not to consume all the milk and to share it to ensure the well-being of another child named Lois, who was frail and unwell at the time. Maybelline in the interview only spoke of one child that she had at the age of 14. Nearly, you were a wet nurse at 14. Would you, would you mind? Yes, it was for a family in Asheville that uh, I was a wet nurse for. for they called the Dickersons. They lived out in the Gould Park section. This man had, was uh, at come to Asheville for his health, you know, that's a great tubercular resort. And he married this colonel's daughter, this old colonel's daughter, and they had this baby. And uh, no formula, that they looked like they couldn't find the formula that would agree with the baby, and the mother didn't have the milk for it. She was kind of 
Well, she's around 37, I think, when she got married. And uh, they, out of all of the women and that they tested, I'm the one that stood the test and they said, baby. And I'd grown a fondness for that child. I loved that baby like my own baby. She was a part of me. I was, I, I willingly gave her part of my life. I sacrificed my own baby sometime. I would say to Lucretia, I'd say, oh, darling, I said, Lord, you're a big, strong baby. Little Lois is weak and sick. I said, now don't cry. I said, save some whole lot of milk for little Lois. You know, and I love that baby. And that's my life ambition someday. And I used to tell her, I said, someday I'm going to make you proud of me. I tell little Lois. Did you ever run into a... Never, and I've tried. Lost. Very, very hard. She never spoke of a sexual assault. There is also no widely known interview where she discusses giving her own children up for adoption. Mom's Mabelly was a private person, so the origin of these rumors raises the questions of how they started. The rumors likely originated from Clarice Teller, well known for her portrayal of Anna Huxtable, Cliff Huxtable's mother on The Cosby Show. In an article from the New York Times on August 9th of 1987 titled, The Pain Behind the Laughter of Moms Mabley, it is mentioned that Clarice Teller, who admired Moms Mabley and had seen her perform at the Apollo Theater in her youth, sought to uncover more about Mabley's life. Finding little known about Mabley, Teller embarked on a quest to discover the real Mom's Mabley, eventually tracking down Mabley's brother, adopted son, daughter, and half-brother. During this exploration, Clarice Teller encountered rumors suggesting that Mom's Mabley may have experienced sexual assault at the age of 11 and 13. According to these rumors, both assaults resulted in pregnancies and the babies were given away. It's important to note that while these rumors exist, they were never confirmed or addressed by Moms Mabelly herself. However, records suggest that in 1916, she was living in Asheville, North Carolina. A birth certificate indicates a 20-year-old Loretta Aiken giving birth to a baby named Jamie Aiken with the father listed as 25-year-old James Reynolds. The birth certificate notes the total children born to Loretta Aiken as two children, creating an inconsistency as she allegedly had two kids by the age of 14. This raises questions about the accuracy of the reported number of children on the birth certificate are the rumors of Mabelly having been assaulted and having two kids at the age of 14. Unfortunately, a traumatic incident did happen to Mom's Mabelly's prominent father, James Aiken, when she was around 11 or 12 years old. Long overdue honor is coming for a mountain firefighter who was killed in the line of duty more than 100 years ago. Jim Aiken was a former slave who went on to become the only black firefighter with the Brevard Fire Department. Well, this weekend, his name will be added to the North Carolina Fallen Firefighters Memorial in Raleigh. The chief says that the recognition brings a sense of pride to those who carry on Aiken's work today. Tragically, in the early morning of August 25th of 1909, a fire broke out. Mabelly's father, the only black member of the Brevard, North Carolina Fire Department, rushed to help the other firefighters stop the fire. Just as the hose was ready to be sprayed onto the fire, a horrible explosion occurred. James Aiken was behind the engine, unwinding the hose when the cylinder blew off. He was thrown 10 or 20 feet and killed instantly. When the other firemen reached James, they found his neck broken and one arm nearly severed from his body. The rest of his body was badly mangled. He was only 48 years old. During his funeral, every store and government building in Brevard was closed. 
He was very well known and respected. The church was packed. The windows of the church were open to allow hundreds of people left standing outside to hear. Every store in Brevard closed for the funeral, as well as all government buildings. James Aiken left his wife five businesses, a large store building, eight houses, hogs, horses, and a considerable sum of money. There is also a misconception about Mabelie's mother, Mary Aiken, suggesting that she passed away on Christmas Day just a few years after Mabelie's father died. However, this information is inaccurate. Mary Aiken entered into a second marriage with Reverend George W. Parton. They relocated to Washington, D.C. around 1915 and later resided in Cleveland, Ohio, as indicated by the 1930 and 1940 census records. Loretta's mother, Mary, passed away decades later on December 31st of 1946 in Washington, D.C. The cause of her death was a tragic accident involving a mail truck while she was crossing the road. Emerging from a prominent Black family with numerous siblings, Jackie Moms Mabelie faced a series of family tragedies, enduring alleged sexual assaults and the unfortunate loss of both parents in tragic accidents. Despite all she went through, it didn't stop her from becoming a trailblazer in the world of comedy, starting her journey at the young age of 15. In her comedy acts, she was an old lady dressed in colorful, mismatched outfits, and she always wore a floppy hat. She chased and loved younger men and hated the older men. This came from a real life story. As a young girl performing on the Toba circuit, she found herself in Macon, Georgia, where she unexpectedly married an older man. Staying at the hotel situated above the Douglas Theater, a prominent black venue, she crossed paths with Leroy, a fellow comedian from the circuit. Leroy visited her while she was unwell, and by the end of the encounter, they spontaneously tied the knot in the hotel. That's how she cooked up her iconic act, hating older men, turning real life drama into comedy gold. I don't know, from the minute I went on the stage, I did the Rich Aunt from Utah, a comedy. A rich aunt from Utah, and it was a very funny comedian on the uh, show, which later became my husband, as I'll tell you. Uh, oh man, as I, well, that's where I got that material for my record from. But one of the finest men in the world. He was more like a father than a. Than oh, a in husband. this uh, early here again, you kid yourself and kid your own history. <laughs> in the sequence we heard, the beginning is being about a young girl marrying an old man. The well, human. that was funny. Yeah. We were yeah. playing Megan Georgia. And a, a covered man by the name of old man Douglas, Douglas, he had a, a theater, and, and above their theater he had this hotel. And I, I had taken very ill in Macon. And anybody in Macon, any man that was caught in a woman's room, had to marry or go to jail. So I was sick, and Leroy, the comic on the show, came in to see how I was feeling. And somebody got to fighting at the hotel, and the cops come in. And, of course, they went in everybody's room, and I'm there. He said, what are you doing? And he says, well, she's sick, and I just came to see how she was feeling. I said, well, you'll either marry or go to jail. So they just called in a preacher and marriage. No license, no brush, no, no nothing. <laughs> just come in, and we married. And he, he was just like more, more like a father to me. He was one of the finest men that ever was. He, he died here in Chicago. And I never, he, in fact, he taught me. I learned so much of him about, from him about timing. I was just about and to raise. Moms Mabelie had performed her comedic routine as an old, sassy lady 
disliking older men for many years. By the time she gained mainstream popularity and attracted white viewers, mom's onstage persona she had developed over decades reflected her real age. But mom's wasn't just about jokes. Her ability to elicit humor went beyond simple surface level laughter. She used humor to shine a light on the real issues in America, especially those hitting the black community, tackling racism, segregation, lynching, and gender inequality. She confronted crucial societal issues in the 60s, advocating for positive change within the black community. Mom showcased her versatile performances and flipped her game from an androgynous comedian to a raunchy old lady blowing up big time. She was on TV shows like The Bill Cosby Show and the Smother Brothers Comedy Hour, who booked moms several times. She performed at big venues like Carnegie Hall, the Rockefeller Center, the Kennedy Center, and the Copa Cabana. She was everywhere making moves. Less than a year before she died, she starred in her first movie, Amazing Grace, in 1974. In matters of family, Moms Mabley made the decision to exclude her eldest daughter, Yvonne Lipscomb, from her inheritance. When Moms Mabley passed away on May 23rd of 1975 in White Plains, New York, she left an estate valued at over half a million dollars, primarily invested in real estate. Moms had multiple children, and prior to her demise, she specifically chose to disinherit her daughter, Yvonne, who resided in Buffalo, New York. Yvonne later became aware of this decision through probate court proceedings. Living in government housing with limited financial resources, Yvonne expressed feelings of hurt and embarrassment stemming from her disinheritance. She explained that she thinks she was disinherited because she didn't visit her mother when she was having a pacemaker put in her heart. She said she couldn't make it because of money problems and her health issues. The will remained unchanged before mom's declining health ultimately led to her passing. Mom's comedic acts stood out, distinguishing her from contemporaries like comedians Dick Gregory, Godfrey Cambridge, Nipsey Russell, and later Richard Pryor. She inspired a multitude of comedians. Mom showcased versatility involving her act from dressing in male clothing to sporting elderly attire, all while highlighting her comedic skills. She incorporated vaudeville traditions of dancing and singing while skillfully addressing politics and societal issues in America. She is a legend of comedy that rightfully holds the title of the true queen of comedy.